comments by two white men towards prominent black women earlier this year set off a social media movement. I didn't hear a word she said. I was, <laughs> I was looking at the James Brown wig. <laughs> that was Bill O'Reilly talking about Congresswoman Maxine Waters. In the other instance, former press secretary Sean Spicer talked down to White House correspondent April Ryan. Out of that came the hashtag Black Women at Work where women of color shared their own stories about mistreatment in the workplace. It's a discussion that still continues today. Tonight, three African-American lawmakers join us to share their own experiences. From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. The hashtag Black Women at Work inspired a conversation that has spread across the country. Women of color are talking about their unique experiences in the workplace and everyday racism. Multnomah County is hosting a series of forums to continue the discussion in Portland. This week, the topic was women of color who are elected officials. What has the experience been like for them? It's a discussion all of us can learn from and hear how we can become an ally. We have an esteemed panel of guests with us tonight. Former State Senator Margaret Carter, the first black woman elected to the Oregon State Legislature. Senator Carter served for a total of 27 years in both the Oregon House and Senate. Representative Janelle Bynum is newly elected to the legislature in 2016. She represents District 51 in Clackamas. She and her husband own four restaurants in the Portland area. And Commissioner Loretta Smith is nearing the end of her second term as Multnomah County Commissioner. She has more than two decades of service in federal government, working for Senator Ron Wyden before her election to the commission in 2010. Welcome everyone to Straight Talk. It's so nice Thank to you. have you, you here. Thank us. you so much for having us. The county has been facilitating dialogue yes. about women of color at work. All of you were on a panel Thursday night, right. the second of four forums. What do you hope comes out of these forums, Commissioner Smith? Well, you know, I don't think that people really think about it and because we're African-American professionals, elected officials, when we saw the uh, Maxine Waters tobacco back in the spring, we thought the same thing happens to us. You know, people talk about our hair and how we look and they want to touch our hair. They want to know how you got your hair like that. And as someone who also wears some James Brown wigs, I was really <laughs> offended by what I heard. But you know, I think it's very important because uh, the conversation needs to happen because there are a lot of things that go on in this community and as an elected official that we go through whether it be through policy making media campaigns that we're talked about you know and we're stigmatized in a way that others are not and i think it's important to have that conversation senator carter what do you think the most important thing is that came out of the forums that you've been to the one last on thursday night I think uh, the very most important thing that came out for me that African-American women had an opportunity to come and express themselves and to mm -hmm. feel supported and to feel as if they have a voice that is worthy of being heard. And that, that was really, really great to me. I enjoyed that a lot. Representative mm -hmm. Bynum? Well, I think the most interesting thing was that um, people a lot of times see us all as the same thing, the same mm -hmm. person, but we're mm -hmm. so different and we can take one experience three different ways, um, just based on the way we were raised, based on our own um, professional experience. We're not all the same, but we all have voices and we're humans. Right. right. These forums were inspired mm -hmm. by the Black Women at Work hashtag, as we mm -hmm. mentioned, yes. that emerged in response to disrespectful comments made about Congresswoman Maxine Waters and in a separate incident to reporter April Ryan. So first, former news commentator at Fox, Bill O'Reilly, made those disparaging comments about Congresswoman Waters' speech about President Trump saying he couldn't listen because he was distracted by her hair. Let's listen to what he said. We're fighting for the democracy. We're fighting for America. We're saying to those who say they're patriotic, but they turned a blind eye to the destruction that he's about to, to cause this country. You're not nearly as patriotic as we are. So what does that mean, Bill? We've been listening all morning. We cannot. I, I didn't hear a word she said. I was, <laughs> I was looking at the James Brown wig. <laughs> uh, if if we have a picture of James, it's the same. It's the same one, no, right? And okay. he's not using it anymore. I got to defend her on that. You guys are all, you're all wrong. I about have this. to defend her on that. She's. A, you can't go after a woman's looks. I think she's very attractive. But she, I didn't say she wasn't attractive. Her I love pretty. James Brown. But it's okay. the same hair. James exactly. Brown are the Godfather of soul. Hat. 
Senator Carter, what effect does a comment like that have? <laughs> Laura, first of all, let me just kind of get myself together, get a little composure, because right. it's absolutely asinine on his part to take away from what she said, which was patriotic idealism of Americans. And for him to go to her hair showed his ignorance, quite frankly. And if I had hair like his, I'd never want to say anything to anybody <laughs> about hair. But the, it, it just drives me absolutely wild that as black women, you're going to look at our hair to determine whether our voice in terms of patriotism has anything to do with the American way. That was ignorant, total ignorance. It was totally part. ignorant. It was an opportunity to marginalize one of the most well-respected members of the Congress and the Congressional right. Black Congress when she was trying to express that patriotism does not limit itself just to white Americans, that black Americans are also patriotic. And she was trying to explain this on the floor of the House. And he minimizes what she was saying Absolutely. by taunting her and then saying that she has a man's hair. Now, you know, have we been minimized and marginalized in the media here? Certainly, certainly. But you know what? This is something that's on national TV and it took hold. And so when I saw this, the black woman at work hashtag, I said, I have to do something. I have to really do something because I think there's an assault on black women here. Absolutely. And if we don't talk about that, even though we have a small African-American uh, community here in Oregon, 5.8% in Multnomah County, the struggle is still real for elected officials of color right here in Portland, Oregon. And That's I right. wanted women to have an opportunity to have their say, just like they did at our board meeting on September 14th, when we had employees of color, we had African-American women come up. Sherelle Jackson talked about how she was investigated nine times. She was to tears. It brought me to tears. And we heard all of these conversations about the institutional entrenched racism at Multnomah County. And I was embarrassed. Do we have a lot of work to do at Multnomah County? Yes, we do. But I think we we have the right kind of board who have the right kind of values about people to make sure that we change the direction in which we've been going to make sure that everybody's word is heard and that everybody is heard in general and that who they are are respected. So I was, I, this, this was a great opportunity. Well, that's why I disagree with her, but I'll come back. Okay, well, <laughs> let me read the, the tweet that Congresswoman Waters fired yes. off after that. She said, I am a strong black woman. Yes. I cannot be intimidated. I'm not going anywhere with the hashtag black women at work. Let me just hear from Janelle Bynum. <laughs> I'm glad she had the presence and the grace to use very, um, very kind words. I don't know that I would have had that grace. Um, he, he's a lucky man because if he had come across me, it wouldn't, wouldn't quite have been the same. But what I wanted to point out in that whole exchange was that there was one woman there who upstood, if, if you can make that term. Um, and then the gentlemen, or gentlemen, the, the men at that table, um, they laughed. They laughed, that's yep. right. They laughed. Now, it could have been a nervous laugh, um, mm -hmm. but how do we move people from the nervous laugh or the acceptable laugh to, say, to, to joining the, the female host to say, mm, yeah, no, not cool? Let me, um, let's play what happened with Sean Spicer. On that yes. same, very same day, mm -hmm. former White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer told a veteran journalist, April Ryan, to stop shaking her head right. in response to an answer he gave. So let's listen to that exchange. No, at some point, report the facts. The facts are that every single person who has been briefed on this subject has come away with the same conclusion. Republican, Democrat, so I'm sorry that that disgusts you. You're shaking your head. I appreciate it, but but you know what? You're asking me a question, and I'm going to answer it, which is the president. I'm sorry. Please stop shaking your head again. <laughs> I can't. I'm going to shake my head. I'm going to read a, a quote from activist Brittany Packnett uh, that kicked off the hashtag after both of these yes. incidents because she wanted people to know that what O'Reilly did and Sean Spicer did is not rare. It's not uncommon. That's so right, here's right. what she said, and then I want to hear some of your stories. She said, every day we are told that our body language is wrong, that both our silence and our speaking are combative, that our mere presence is intimidating, that our looks matter more than our work, that our natural hair is unprofessional, that we couldn't possibly have affirmed our station by our merits, are looked over and ignored, or endure a worse pay gap than our white women counterparts. It happens to black women of every station, whether we're wage earners, pull in high salaries, mm -hmm. whether we're domestic workers or in the C-suite. 
Black women have been at work since the dawn of this nation and have worked ourselves to the bone. We deserve dignity and respect. We've earned no less. No matter what, we will show it to ourselves and each other. Senator Carter, I'd love to hear some of your experiences and your reaction to what we've been seeing. Well, when I first went to the legislature, Laura, it's interesting because uh, somebody did a, um, um, a review, if video. you will, a video uh, on the different hairdos of Margaret Carter. They used to come up and feel my hair and say, well, how can you get your hair to do that? And, um, <laughs> well, let me talk about your hair. I don't want to talk about my hair. I want to talk about policy. Right. See, that's the thing, is that we are distracted from being serious about things that make a difference in our communities by somebody talking about our hair, or somebody talk about our clothes, how we look, and that kind of stuff. Well, the interesting thing is, um, when you look at the whole issue of segregation, African Americans had to look twice as good as their white female counterparts or we were going to be put down. Yes. We have to also, I don't have wash and wear hair, Laura. And so, you know what, I have to be careful when it rains. Or I have to have, when I have a bad hair day, I have to have my friend the wig who's on the side that I can <laughs> wear because I have a bad hair day. And so, why do you take away from my presence of being able to talk about policy and to be so trite and talk about something like my hair or my looks. I think that that's a part of, of white society that is indignant and that really troubles me even until this day. And I am 81 years of age and have been hearing it for 81 Entrenched years. Entrenched bias. You and that's exactly right. You know, when I first came to the county, um, prior to that, I worked for Senator Wyden for 20 years and I always dressed professionally. And one of the commissioners, we were three of us in the, um, in the uh, elevator and said, are you gonna dress like this every day? Mm -hmm. uh, you mean professional? And another commissioner chimed in and said, yes, yeah, she's gonna dress like that every day. So it is dismissive. It is something to distract us from the real business of the people. And I don't stand for it because I don't po apologize for how I look right. or for how I dress, right. but I will speak up and I will stand up. And you know this about my children in this community. I fight for our young people and our older people in this community. It's not about how I look or how I dress, but people want to minimize you to just the simplest of things. It's just called being professional. Representative Bynum, thoughts? It's, it's a lot. I try to stay focused on the work that I'm doing right. and um, trying to look ahead, not trying to get distracted by what I'm wearing or, you know, um, how I look that day. That's irrelevant. We came to get a job done, yes. and that's the only thing that matters. You have an interesting story about what motivated you to run. You have, your yeah. middle name is Sojourner, and you had yeah. a conversation <laughs> with your mom about... So first of all, as a child, I hated that middle name. I didn't care for my first name because, you know, on those little license tags and you go into the, um, to the tourist little stores, they yeah. never had Janelle. It was always Michelle or Nicole. Um, <laughs> but my parents gave me this beautiful name and it was, uh, it's Sojourner and named after Sojourner Truth. And she was a women's um, suffragist and abolitionist. And she was the first woman to sell her picture. She made selfies, essentially, um, as she went around the country speaking on behalf of women and um, abolition. And so I, I try to take her spirit into the, the halls, the chamber, um, to make sure that I'm, I'm always representing my community well. But I'm also not backing down on issues that really matter to us. Um, we, what I try to explain to people is that this country was not set up for anyone who did not own land and wasn't a male. It just wasn't. So all, and white. So all of the things that, that we see, that all of the privileges that we have now as women, as minorities, someone had to fight for that deliberately. So that's why we're here. Um, and making sure that we um, fight for the next generation, our, for ourselves and our posterity. That's in the preamble. That's why I'm here. The hashtag Black Women at Work spawned mm -hmm. thousands yes. of tweets. And I want to read just a couple of them. And I know, uh, Commissioner Smith, you have, a, uh, have an experience related to at least one of these. Research shows it's common for whites to distrust the credentials and abilities of women of color. And that was the hashtag Black Women at Work. I've been told repeatedly that I have a bad attitude by a white female coworker and that I need to straighten up. Arrived a keynote, white faculty asked me to get them some water. I get it, <laughs> then tell them why I'm really there. When you know you have to line up a white ally to speak up, mm. interpret for you at a new job. 
And Commissioner, I was surprised to hear that you had a, a similar experience. A very similar experience my first year here and I was asking a um, department head, she was a white woman, I asked her a, a direct question about what was happening in the departments and wanted to get some feedback and some information. She said she didn't know what I was talking about. And so I asked her in three different ways about the information that I wanted to get. And so finally I told my, my chief of staff, he's a white male, I said, would you please ask her the question and maybe she'll answer you. And she did. She gave him the information that he wanted. And all he did was just tweak a, a couple of words and we got the information. But it's, it's, again, this is that structural racism because I am the second African-American woman to be on the Multnomah County Commission in the history of 163 years. The first was the great Gladys McCoy, and that was about 30 years ago. So they are not used to having black women in charge and asking questions. And so it can be interpreted as being angry, but I'm very direct, and that's not angry at all. And if another commissioner asks a question, they'll, they'll release the information. But when I ask the question, it is challenged. So it's, there's, a, there's a way that you have to kind of, there's a rhythm about it that you have to do and so I think seven years in people are kind of used to my directness and and they answer the questions but at the same time you, you're still minimized in in different situations and so you just kind of have to work through it and I think all of us here we've we've learned how to work within systems because there are certain patterns and practices that are in institutions like organizations like Multnomah County that have happened for many years and that's just the way it, it, it is until someone calls it out. And I think we've called some of those things out. Senator Carter, right. I, um, only about a minute before we have to take a break, but I wanted to ask you about the media portrayal of elected officials who are women of color. And you've had an experience when you left the legislature in 2009 right. to join Human Services, the way the media portrayed you compared to a recent article just this week when two white male lawmakers are being appointed to a new job. Can you speak to that? Oh, sure. When I left, everybody, um, the news media, was saying uh, that uh, Margaret Carter is leaving so that she can increase up hers. And it went all over the nation because that PERS issue was on the agenda. And so I was the face of that. I was um, portrayed in a way that was just terrible, number one. But number two, I was not even able, for five years I worked for DHS and was not able to get PERS, period. And no other person has had to deal with that. All the white males that have been appointed to higher positions get their purrs. I was denied that for five long years. And it's, it's um, troubling to me because that is total discrimination and institutionalized racism. That's how it looks, through policy and practice. Why is it that white men can get purrs and I, as a black woman, could not get it? That begs the question of how much institutionalized racism is alive and well in Oregon. Well, the conversation right now about Ted Ferrioli, he's right. a great man, he's a visionary. No one is talking about padding of the, of the PERS at all. He's anyway. being appointed to a new that's Yeah, right. to the uh, public. Northwest uh, Power Council. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. We need to take a break, but Thank you. more conversation coming up yes. in just two minutes. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. We're talking about the unique experiences of women of color occupying public office. Welcome once again to my guests, Multnomah County Commissioner Loretta Smith, former Oregon State Senator Margaret Carter, and Oregon State Representative Janelle Bynum. Once again, it's great to have you here. Thank, Thank you. you. We were talking earlier about the media portrayal of women of color, and you have another story, Senator Carter, about a lobbying effort on part of a, a bill where the Willamette Week used a picture of you, a graphic that was unsettling. Well, tell us about that. Quite unsettling, to say the least. I um, took a job as a lobbyist, expanded my company that I've had for 35 years, and um, one of my friends had asked me to work on a bill that was T21 that dealt with young people being able to purchase cigarettes and or a vape, and then the police could go up and ask them where they bought it from. In my community, I've seen too many black and brown kids who were killed because the minute the police stop them, they either run or they ask what's in your backpack or other things of that nature. And I didn't want to see that happen again. I only said to the legislature, please take this sanction piece out. 
And I can very much support that because I am a prevention person in terms of health care. And they didn't want to take it out. So I just started working with other friends of mine. And then the Willamette Week picked it up and talked about my, um, my record as um, a legend and you know this civil kind of rights. stuff. Civil rights. And yes. yet I would support Big Tobacco. I was not supporting Big Tobacco. I was trying to get them to see them being the legislature. And I think we have a picture of, of the picture that the Willamette Weeks yes, and yes. And for them to try to portray me as being a person who is big tobacco um, just really disturbed me. And quite a few of my friends, including um, Commissioner Loretta Smith, called in and talked to Willamette Weekly about that. I did. Um, There's the picture I there. Did. How can you put Margaret Carter on a $20 bill, number one, she should have been on a $100 or a $1,000 bill, <laughs> and put her on a pack of cigarettes right. to minimize, again, and marginalize. There's a huge double standard. And I called the Willamette Week. I said, look, you don't do this to white re legislators who have retired to try to um, dis be dismissive of their efforts. She's trying to deal with a profiling issue that happens with our black and brown boys right. particularly and you know I was I was kind of humored a little bit and said yeah but still she shouldn't do it we're, we're held to a, uh, a different, different standard, standard. And I, I thought it was disrespectful of all the work that she's done to put her on a $20 bill. I mean, that, that insinuates something else. How cheap. So, That's yeah, very it, cheap. Yeah. Well, well, disrespect big news. sells newspapers, so. Yeah. <laughs> big news in the legislature <laughs> for a woman of color, veteran oh, lawmaker, yeah. State Senator Jackie Winters. Yay. The Oregon Senate yes. Republicans announced yes. she yes. will succeed. Ted Ferrioli, there's a picture of her. She'll yes. be the new Senate Republican leader. Winters is the longest serving black senator in the Oregon legislature. What does mm -hmm. this mean, Janelle Bynum? Oh my goodness, it means it's possible for me. It means it's yeah, possible right. for my daughters. Um, it, it means it's possible for a million other little girls in this state um, to be a, um, a leader in the, in the Senate. Um, you know, I, I admire Senator Winters because she has the respect of her colleagues. Mm -hmm. Um, she's non-traditional in the sense that um, she's not an automatic Democrat, she's a Republican, and it's very nice to be able to work with people across the aisle. Um, and she's just, she's just a bad mamma jamma. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she is definitely have to play with that man. That's what she I is. <laughs> she's the real deal. She's right. effective. Um, she's, she's very effective. Right. And, and she's 80. 80, 80 years old, mm -hmm. um, just a fighter, yes, just a yeah. fighter. So we need more women like that. We only have a couple minutes left, but I did want to make sure that we got to possible solutions. So yeah. how can we drive towards solutions to some of these entrenched biases, maybe some biases that white people don't even really realize that they have? Thoughts about I, that? You know, I think that the media, they need to hire um, people of color. Like Tony Hernandez, he did some great work for the Oregonian about some of the things that we did in District 2. And when you hire people of color, you get a different kind of message. He did one of the best articles that you could ac actually do on me in regards to Selma, the movie Selma, and bringing in kids to let them see how actually uh, African Americans were subjected to Jim Crow laws and, and how we were um, portrayed and, and what happened on Bloody Sunday when uh, Martin Luther King and those folks and John Lewis walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge mm -hmm. and me and uh, Senator Carter and uh, the, the sheriff we had a, a Q&A after that uh, after former that sheriff. movie mm -hmm. the former sheriff and we talked with the young people about how we got the right to vote and he did an, a marvelous job he did. and so I think we have to contact the uh, the advertisers of these media companies because we have to demand, because we're consumers, that we get the kind of coverage that's positive, that we're doing, making a difference in our community. And until we start doing that and, and yeah. demanding that we have people of color on their staffs that are, you know, they understand who we are and, and what we're about, it's not going to change. It's about seeing our humanity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, if I tell you something offends me or something hurts, believe me, I'm not intentionally trying to be a victim. I just have feelings, just like you. So I, I think um, just believing people and hearing them when they say there's a problem. Thank you. White all. women have to stand <laughs> up and be counted on these issues. She should not have had to call. I have to stop to you that. there because we're yeah. out of time, but I want to hear more from that. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Happy Thanksgiving and thank, thank you for watching. Thank See you. Thank you, Laura. Right. Have a good you. night.